Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Hong Ying Wang on China's role in global governance. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, the CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Each week, I'm very happy to welcome a guest here into the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo to talk about some important aspect of global governance or international public policy. This week, my guest is my colleague, Hong Ying Wang, visiting associate professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and a noted expert on China and China's role in global governance. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, just for our audience, let's talk a bit in general terms about uh, the current state of play mm -hmm. and China's role in global governance. We all know that China is a growing power, has been a fast growing power for a long time, a signature member of the BRICS group of companies, the emerging economies that have exhibited the strongest growth rates in recent years. But uh, what exactly is China's role now in global governance? How would you characterize it? Oh, I would say China is an under-participant in global governance. Uh, if you look at China's contribution to major global governance initiatives financially, in terms of personnel, in terms of ideas, programs, it is uh, ranked much lower than you would expect. China is the second largest economy, uh, is a major uh, trading power in the world, and, and major military and political power. In many ways, one would expect China to play a very prominent role. But if you look at um, its actual behavior, China has been actually keeping a pretty low profile. It doesn't participate nearly as actively, for example, as another BRIC country, Brazil. It doesn't participate as much as its neighbor, Japan, uh, especially in terms of financial contributions, even controlling for GDP per capita, the wealth factor. And uh, certainly since we're in Canada, China falls way behind Canada as a middle power in its contribution to various areas of global governance. So I, I would say China is, is under-participating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now China has had a seat at the United Nations now for a very long time, mm -hmm. once it finally wrested it away from Taiwan. Right. So it's, it's been a key player in at least one uh, pivotal global governance organ. It wasn't a member of the G7 or G8, but now the G20 is taking on more and more of the functions that the G7 and G8 used to take, and China is a member of the G20. So how much of this is the f simply a function of the fact that China is relatively late in the game getting into at least some of the relevant groups that do take responsibility for leading global governance? Yeah, well, I think that's certainly a factor. If you want to explain why China seems to be underplaying its role, uh, uh, the, the short history, relatively speaking, short history of China's involvement uh, is a factor. But if you ask uh, diplomats, I'm sure you interact with them all the time, uh, the level of sophistication on the part of China's diplomats, for example, statesmen, uh, is actually quite high. So if you're thinking, oh, maybe this is a new country not experienced enough, not knowing the rules, I don't think that's true anymore. It might have been the case in the 1990s, but China has been around long enough, uh, certainly compared to uh, you know, Brazil and you know, some of the emerging countries, and it certainly has the capability. I think for China, the issue is more, it doesn't exactly know uh, itself how much of a role, what kind of a role, what China would stand for. Uh, one reason is China's multiple identities. Right. China has traditionally portrayed itself to be uh, part of the third world developing country. Um, now it's increasingly uh, part of the larger powers. And how does China position itself on important trade issues and intellectual property rights issues and so on? It's no longer that simple. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason, um, in addition to the, 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 the length uh, factor you mentioned. And the other is China's extremely complicated domestic politics. It really puts a lot of constraints on China's interest and capability of uh, greater involvement in global mm -hmm. governance. I would like to ask more about that in a minute, but mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask you whether there's an issue here um, with China not thinking of itself as a global player traditionally. I, mean, I mm -hmm. speak to colleagues who study China more closely than I do, and many of them say, if you look back at the broad sweep of Chinese history, China is a, a civilization that's been very focused geographically on East Asia. It's always thought of itself as a regional player. Mm -hmm. uh, it had tributary states relating to it, so it was sort of semi-hegemonic for hundreds and hundreds of years, mm -hmm. but never really thought of itself as a global player. Mm -hmm. is, is that still true? Is, I, are they still I, primarily defining themselves as interested in regional governance as opposed to global governance? 
Uh, I think that's a very good point. I think traditionally China's interest and its expertise has been within the region, but I think in recent years the Chinese ambition has far exceeded that. Uh, if you look at China's discourse on China's position in the world, it usually looks at the U.S. as a comparable power, uh, not so much Japan. You know, what can we do to you know, be uh, maybe a successor of uh, the U.S., if not a successor, one of the partners of a multilateral, multipolar world. So I think uh, traditionally regional focus was very much a uh, characteristic of Chinese diplomacy, but increasingly I think at least the ambition, maybe not the reality, of China's final place in the world is at the global level. Mm. Yeah. And is its underperformance in global governance a function at all of other countries' resistance to the idea of China playing a larger role? Very much so. I think despite all the rhetoric we hear, China should take on more responsibility, the G2, you know, first, uh, you know, uh, what is it, proposed by uh, some policymakers in Washington. Um, well, the uh, overall, I, I would say, Western industrialized countries and even some of China's neighbors are very dubious about really uh, the, the prospect of China playing a bigger role. It's, it's ideologically different, uh, culturally, in terms of values, not so much uh, socialized yet in the prevailing international norms. So from a Western point of view, it's kind of a very uncertain prospect. How eager are they really in welcoming China into a bigger role is, is highly questionable. Mm, very good. Well, we'll be back again in a minute with Hong Yang Wang to talk about China's role in global governance. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Let's talk about the domestic politics, which I think uh, boggle everyone's mind in North America who try to pay mm -hmm. attention to it. Very complicated a country from a domestic political point of view, and I'm, I'm sure we don't know enough to understand it. But you've been studying this very closely. So how would you characterize some of the main dynamics, some of the main forces, issues, players in Chinese domestic politics that actually constrain China's mm -hmm. global governance role? Well, I think uh, that maybe there are two dimensions. One is uh, the constraint in terms of China's interest, how much uh, energy and interest China's leadership uh, can devote to global governance issues because of its various domestic preoccupations. And the other is China's capability uh, in participating, contributing, especially ideas to global governance. So let's maybe start with, uh, with the interest aspect. The leadership of China is very uh, interested in uh, having international prestige uh, in one way that bolsters the legitimacy of the regime. But on the other hand, the more pressing challenge for its legitimacy comes from uh, all kinds of domestic problems. So the environmental degradation, which increasingly is a source of public protest in China, the rising inequality, not only between regions, the coastal versus inland, but also different social economic groups. There are people who do very well, extremely wealthy, uh, but there are lots of people still left behind uh, in China. So, uh, and then official corruption, it's a huge issue. So you can name any number of issues that uh, create sources of political instability, the mass uh, incidents, so to speak, uh, numbers in the tens of thousands, if not more. So if you put yourself in <laughs> leadership's shoes, how much time do I have 24 hours a day to think about what China's road might be in the world? I need to keep the domestic front under control. So that, in a way, constrains uh, the leadership's just uh, ability to, uh, to, to participate and their interest. They're primarily interested in keeping China itself uh, in order at home and the regime um, safe, so to speak, from political uh, instability. Then on the other uh, side of the coin uh, is the limited capability of the Chinese society as a whole to participate as, let's say, the Brazilian civil society, the Canadian civil society, because when we talk about global governance, we aren't just talking about intergovernmental organizations, right? So at these uh, international fora where um, many women's groups, environmental groups, you know, uh, whatever, children's rights groups, they, they come together, they put forth ideas, uh, share their practices, what can the Chinese contribute? Very little. The civil society in China is so weak and they're so unable to express alternative 
uh, views and opinions from the government. So that aspect of uh, global governance is just an area that China has simply mm. no capacity, I would say, to contribute to. So those are at least you know, two aspects why domestic dynamics makes China such a weak and low participant. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. you talked about the legitimacy of the regime and concerns yeah. about it domestically. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you characterize the legitimacy of the regime? Uh, is it generally considered a legitimate regime? And if so, why? If not, why yeah. not? It, it's amazing that it has survived this long, right? Uh, the fall of the Soviet communist regime led some people to say, oh, maybe China will be next. But amazingly, it has been, so to speak, legitimate long enough to survive until this day. But I think that is changing and changing very fast. I think historically, uh, the CCP's legitimacy rested on uh, nationalism. This was the party that liberated China from imperialism, ended China's hundred years of humiliation and whatnot. Well, that lasted a while and still resonates, I think, with some part of the population today. But in recent years, the biggest source of legitimacy is its ability to deliver economic uh, performance. So China has done so well. Uh, well, maybe we're not legitimately uh, elected, but we have done the job well. So I think that has played a big role in maintaining some level of legitimacy. But imagine an economic crisis of some sort, which is even China is not immune to. Uh, when that happens, what happens? Uh, you know, all the other sources of legitimacy that other governments perhaps uh, enjoy practically don't exist in China. So when this one pillar falls, it's very likely that China would be thrown into some kind of political turmoil. The legitimacy issue is, is really serious. And I'll just tell you how the government officials themselves see this. Uh, there are multiple government officials who report that they have to wear you know, an, uh, some kind of a mechanism that would alert them anytime there's any kind of, of mishap. Could be three people gathering in a public square. They have to react right away. What kind of a party is this? This is a party on constant alert 24-7. And so that tells you something about the party's own perception of its legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Very fragile. One thing fragile. we do read about uh, yeah. here in terms of Chinese domestic politics are separatist threats. How serious are separatist threats in China and how much do those preoccupy the regime? Uh, very, very serious. Uh, threats to the regime. So in Xinjiang, the Uyghurs, in Tibet, in you know, recent days we've seen more and more uh, Tibetan, I guess, religious or non-religious people, extreme uh, reaction to the Chinese regime, you know, setting themselves on fire. You know, one has to be desperate to do something like that. Uh, and so um, I guess since the late 90s, the Chinese government has launched this uh, project of economic development for the Western regions. Uh, it's not because those regions are the poorest. Um, they are poor, but there are other regions in China that would have benefited from the economic uh, you know, programs the government designed. The government distributed money, resources there, primarily because of this worry of separatism. They wanted to at least deliver some economic goodies so these ethnic minorities in the western, southwestern, northwestern part of China would uh, perhaps uh, be more, uh, more compliant with the regime. But uh, that in itself tells you that this is a threat the government has tried very hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. But usually these sort of control-oriented responses tend to backfire historically. Mm -hmm. They tend to weaken legitimacy of the regime over time. It doesn't sound as though there's any acknowledgement of that, or at least very little in Beijing. Mm -hmm. There was back in the day, right, when the, when the one-child policy was instituted, Mm -hmm. uh, some of the ethnic minorities were actually exempted. Or yeah, given they were. They still are. Right. Yeah. And that seemed to be some sort of soft power nod <laughs> towards right, the inclusiveness of yeah. Chinese society. But now when we see self-immolations happening in Tibet, mm -hmm. very quick crackdown. Mm -hmm. right? People are, are immediately arrested who've been witnessing these. Their cell phones are confiscated so that no videos can get out. I mean, it's a very in-your-face kind of mm -hmm. repression of these expressions of discontent. That must surely be further weakening. Yeah, I, I think the government has tried to use both the carrot and the stick. Uh, the carrot has been a lot of economic resources, building uh, 
the highway and whatnot. Even that, of course, it's controversial. It's good for the economy, maybe, for some parts of the region, but it also uh, dilutes the cultural cohesiveness and so on. So there's some of those maybe carrots combined with something else. And then definitely, recently, you see a lot more use of the stick. Um, and it's probably a sign that the grip is uh, being undermined so much. I'm sure the government would not like to do that, especially because the Chinese government is very concerned about China's image and all these things playing out in Western media is certainly no good. But they must be running out of other ways of dealing with these crises. Mm, fascinating. Yeah. Well, we'll be back again in a moment with Hong Ying Wang. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So we've talked a bit about the domestic constraints on China's global governance role. Uh, let's talk a bit about the international constraints. We've already uh, said a little bit about some of the suspicions of other countries, and not necessarily entirely willing mm -hmm. to let China play much more of a global governance role. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, there's a sense, uh, you may agree, that a lot of countries are beginning to look at China, its economic weight, its, its uh, increasing technical and human capacity, and beginning to think, you know, maybe these should be leveraged. Maybe these should be used for the greater good in a more constructive way. And mm -hmm. maybe one way of overcoming some of the fears of China's uh, potentially negative international role would be to co-opt China into more of a responsible Mm -hmm. global governance role. So I imagine the outside world is a bit torn right. as to whether they do or do not want yeah, China. Yeah, how much? Uh, <laughs> so, so who are some of the relevant players here and, and how are they leaning and um, on balance do you think China could play more of a global governance role than it's doing mm -hmm. um, given the permissiveness or constraints of the international context? Yeah, I think, well, obviously uh, the big powers the U.S., the European Union, Japan, uh, China's Asian neighbors are very relevant uh, to this issue. Um, and I guess the World Bank, IMF, World Trade Organization, and so on. International organizations also are very relevant actors. Um, I, I'd say, well, let's start with the U.S. The U.S. Uh, would like China to make more of a contribution in especially the, the re balancing of the global financial system, right? China has accumulated so much foreign currency reserves as the biggest uh, creditor for the U.S. So uh, certainly the U.S. would like to see China play more of a role uh, as, as a consumer in the global economy and balancing the global financial system. Uh, but the U.S. probably, uh, for various reasons, of course the U.S. itself is divided. Some are more willing to see China play a bigger role, but some are really suspicious of what China might use when it has a bigger voice, more of a voting power in various organizations. And militarily, uh, this is perhaps on the horizon. Uh, the only potential enemy the U.S. faces, I guess, aside from al-Qaeda and you know, the war on terror, um, so I think the U.S. has reasons to want China to play a bigger role in the financial sector in uh, addressing the financial imbalance, but not so much on other issues. Uh, I guess the European Union seems to be less preoccupied with the military, potentially military uh, threat from, from China and sees China more as an economic opportunity as well as a challenger. So uh, I think there... Um, the majority probably are more open to a bigger role for, for China. And then China's own Asian neighbors, well, Japan is a case where history never dies and seems to continue to <laughs> complicate current relations between the two countries. And then you have countries in Southeast Asia that are immediately uh, next to, to China. And for them, China's power is both an enormous uh, blessing because of the market. Uh, they depend so much on China for economic uh, development, uh, market, and so on. But they also live right next to this giant, the South China Sea, being an obvious uh, uh, source of potential conflict between them and China and the issue of Taiwan. Right. So these people have both reasons to want China to do uh, better as a, as a potential economic partner for them, uh, but also always wary what, what military and political implications might mm. be of, of such a huge neighbor uh, in the region. So that's why they 
probably all would like to see a continued presence of the U.S. and maybe outside powers in general to balance China's potential uh, threat to their mm -hmm. security and what other issues. Yeah. How much of a constraint is the fact that China's been relatively slow integrating into the global economy, relatively late comer to the trade regime, mm -hmm. uh, progress but not complete progress yet on intellectual property rights yeah. uh, and investment um, terms and conditions, and so far no sign of a move towards a floating exchange rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, I, I, I think this is a really complicated question. Uh, I understand what you're saying from an outsider's point of view. Look at China is so slow. It has, why, why hasn't it done more? But I think increasingly China's uh, policymakers as well as intellectuals are raising the opposite question. And what they're saying is perhaps understandably, the post keeps moving. It used to be if we just uh, you know, pass laws about intellectual property rights, we have made progress. Well, we did, and we've joined all kinds of intellectual property rights regimes, but the implementation hasn't been great. Uh, now we're not measured on the first uh, at all, we're just measured on implementation. So we always fall short. So I think from a Chinese point of view, you can understand there's a certain level of frustration of this lack of recognition of how much China has already done moving toward these moving targets. Uh, so in, in terms of um, the exchange rate, well, China's uh, currency has appreciated, I think, 20, 25 percent over the last few years. Uh, it used to be 8.4 to a dollar, now it's 6.7 or something like that. So. It's not as fast, perhaps, as the world would like to see, but uh, I think it is important also to give credit to the Chinese, both the government and the people, for what they have already done. It's a slow process of mutual accommodation. It can't just be, it's our target and you keep moving and we keep pulling it away from you. That just gets very, very difficult mm -hmm. for both sides. And it does yeah. seem as though certain parts of China are actually very well plugged into the global economy and other parts mm -hmm. not so much, so Hong Kong, Shanghai, Mm -hmm. very well integrated in the global economy. Is, is the constraint here also that China's not really a unitary actor from a global economic perspective? Yeah, oh definitely. I think that's a really good point. Uh, there's, there's a China on the coast and there's a China in the middle and there's a China in the western part. So uh, I think if you're a business uh, company going to China investing, if you're in Shanghai, you're probably quite comfortable. If you go to Chongqing or someplace else, inland, it's, it is almost like a different country. Mm. Yeah, so things do vary from region to region. Mm, very much. Yeah. Mm. We'll be back again in a moment with Hong Ying Wang. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So in our last segment, I'd like to ask you to gaze into your crystal ball and cast your mind forward 10, <laughs> 20 years and, and tell us what you think might happen. Uh, where is China going? Is it going in a direction that's going to give it a bigger role in global governance or further diminish its role in global governance? What are some of the main trends, issues, threats, opportunities that you see as somebody who watches China closely? If only I had a crystal ball, I would look through it. <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, what we have witnessed in the last few weeks uh, with this uh, you know, incident uh, related to Bo Xilai, the uh, uh, party secretary of Chongqing, uh, who has made a career uh, on his very charismatic uh, political leadership style, as well as probably ruthless uh, crackdown of his opponents, uh, and uh, this uh, sort of nostalgia for the Cultural Revolution period. Um, he has been removed from his position, uh, and uh, probably his supporters in the next uh, months and weeks and months will be losing power as well, uh, in just ahead of the 18th Party Congress. But this, I think, um, is an indicator of the increasing division within the Chinese Communist Party, both for ideological reasons and for reasons of personal power, political ambitions. So that. I think will play a very big role in shaping the near-term future of, of, of China politically. Um, it is perhaps the first time I can think of in uh, 20 years or so such public uh, split has happened uh, within the leadership. But if this is indicative of a larger trend, uh, one can imagine uh, some sort of a, a factional model of uh, intra-party relationship. So the party itself, 
may stay, but it may become a political entity that uh, is internally divided and uh, different groups, different factions have to compromise a lot more than before. And they may have some kind of a political arrangement where one faction might uh, uh, take power uh, for a period of time, another faction for another period of time. So it's sort of reminiscent of a Japanese model of an earlier time, uh, although it would be much less democratic uh, given the larger uh, political system. So that's one aspect of future development. Um, another thing, as I said before, if there is an economic crisis, many, many things that are time bombs in the Chinese uh, economic system, social system, could explode. Uh, and then that becomes a much bigger transformation than uh, you know the leadership elite struggle. So but an economic crisis in China is something like the annual growth rate drops from seven percent to five percent, right? Yes. Yeah. Whereas for us, five percent would be a miracle it year. Sounds good. Yeah, but for China, because of the population, uh, the unemployment issue, you know, half the college graduates do not find jobs in two or three years. So uh, without a 7% and above growth rate, uh, the unemployment issue just becomes unmanageable. That's why the imperative, no matter what happens, the 7% has to be met. But so that can't if, go on indefinitely. It, exactly, as you say. So if it becomes 5%, 4%, the leadership will have serious problems to deal with. And Chinese society, all the other issues people are willing to put aside because at least they're doing OK economically, are going to become much more salient. Then you have a convergence of many things that don't go the way uh, they, they should go. Uh, it could be a, a total crisis. Mm -hmm. So let's hope that's not the scenario. What about democratization? It's been more than 20 years since mm -hmm. Tiananmen Square. Mm -hmm. And I remember that well. I remember thinking, OK, this just means that before mm -hmm. long there will be serious democratization. And I've been wrong now for more than 20 years. <laughs> uh, well, is I, it still a distant I, I guess one thing is, what is what is democracy in a Chinese context? It's really difficult to uh, to say. There certainly have been many steps toward political liberalization. If you look at the netizens, what people are able to debate and uh, what they're able to participate in their own way. Uh, so if democratization is a process, I would say it has already happened. It has happened very slowly. But it has happened in the last uh, 10, 20 years. Uh, but is there an end point when we suddenly declare China has arrived? It's now a democracy. Uh, that's very difficult to say. You know, is competitive multi-party democracy out of the question? Uh, that's, that's not something I see on the horizon. Uh, for the simple uh, reason that the Communist Party has been so successful in, in cracking down on any form of political organization, whether it's Falun Gong or any alternative political parties, religious, any kind of organization. Three people gathering on a square mm -hmm. is not tolerated. So people may be very unhappy, but they're individuals. Uh, they are not able so far to organize in any way. So actually, uh, one scholar pointed out uh, th th this very interesting phenomenon. We always count these thousands and thousands of mass protests as if they're a sign of the Communist Party's weakness. And they are, in a way. But on the other hand, the enormous number also suggests they're not able to gather their forces together. There is not one effective opposition, or two, or three. There are thousands and thousands. These are all very small scale things that the party can actually suppress relatively easily. So if you're think, thinking about multi-party competition, the, the, the problem is what's the alternative organization? The party itself may be rotten, the Communist Party, but what is the alternative? So I think that's something that's not immediately clear to me. Mm, but it could, in principle, grow organically. Right? I mean, mm. Now that relations with Taiwan are better, there's much more in the way of cross-strait traffic and contact. And one would imagine, at least on the coast of the, of the People's Republic, mm -hmm. people are now more aware of the Taiwanese system, mm -hmm. which is a, actually a very highly functioning competitive multi-party democracy. Would that not sort of encourage wistful thinking or yeah, I, th I think buy, people borrow ideas? Yeah, I think people, especially the intellectuals who, who are more liberally oriented, uh, look at Taiwan as a potential example, a, a model for China to, to emulate. But the, the problem is the party, the Communist Party, also is extremely aware of the danger of alternative political organizations. So, so far, it hasn't done what the KMT did in the late 1980s, which is to open the system to multiple parties. As long as the Communist Party 
keeps that its policy, it's just really difficult. What might happen is a total collapse of the system without a coherent alternative there to step in and take the country to its next stage of political development. I think in that scenario, uh, a lot of people will, will lose. It's not just the Communist Party. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming in and sharing your obviously wide expertise on China with us. I've thank learned you. a lot and I, I hope my audience will agree that they have as well. And to the audience, thank you for joining us. Join us again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Sweep of Chinese history. China is a, a civilization that's been very focused geographically on East Asia. It's always thought of itself as a regional player. Mm -hmm. uh, it had tributary states relating to it, so it was sort of semi-hegemonic for hundreds and hundreds of years, mm -hmm. but never really thought of itself as a global player. Mm -hmm. is, is that still true? Is, I, are they still I, primarily defining themselves as interested in regional governance as opposed to global governance? Uh, I think that's a very good point. I think traditionally China's interest and its expertise has been within the region, but I think in recent years the Chinese ambition has far exceeded that. Uh, if you look at China's discourse on China's position in the world, it usually looks at the U.S. as a comparable power, uh, not so much Japan. You know, what can we do to, you know, be uh, maybe a successor of uh, the U.S., if not a successor, one of the partners of a multilateral, multipolar world. So I think uh, traditionally regional focus was very much a uh, characteristic of Chinese diplomacy, but increasingly I think at least the ambition, maybe not the reality, of China's final place in the world is at the global level. Mm. Yeah. And is its underperformance? In I don't think that's true anymore. It might have been the case in the 1990s, but China has been around long enough, uh, certainly compared to uh, you know Brazil and you know some of the emerging countries, and it certainly has the capability. I think for China, the issue is more, it doesn't exactly know uh, itself how much of a role, what kind of a role, what China would stand for. Uh, one reason is China's multiple identities. Right? China has traditionally portrayed itself to be uh, part of the third world developing country. Um, now it's increasingly uh, part of the larger powers. And how does China position itself on important trade issues and intellectual property rights issues and so on? It's no longer that simple. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason, uh, in addition to the, 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 the length uh, factor you mentioned. And the other is China's extremely complicated domestic <laughs> politics. It really puts a lot of constraints on China's interest and capability of uh, greater involvement in global governance. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you more about that in a minute, but mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask you whether there's an issue here um, with China not thinking of itself as a global player traditionally. I, mean, I mm -hmm. speak to colleagues who study China more closely than I do, and many of them say, if you look back at the broad... Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Hong Ying Wang on China's role in global governance. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, the CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Each week I'm very happy to welcome a guest here into the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo to talk about some important aspect of global governance or international public policy. This week, my guest is my colleague, Hong Ying Wang, visiting associate professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and a noted expert on China and China's role in global governance. So welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, just for our audience, let's talk a bit in general terms about uh, the current state of play mm -hmm. and China's role in global governance. We all know that China is a growing power, has been a fast growing power for a long time, a signature member of the BRICS group of companies, the emerging economies that have exhibited the strongest growth rates in recent years. But uh, what exactly is China's role now in global governance? How would you characterize it? Oh, I would say China is an under-participant in global governance. Uh, if you look at China's contribution to major global governance initiatives, financially, in terms of personnel, in terms of ideas, programs, it is 
uh, ranked much lower than you would expect. China is the second largest economy, uh, is a major uh, trading power in the world and, and major military and political power. In many ways, one would expect China to play a very prominent role. But if you look at um, its actual behavior, China has been actually keeping a pretty low profile. It doesn't participate nearly as actively, for example, as another BRIC country, Brazil. It doesn't participate as much as its neighbor, Japan, uh, especially in terms of financial contributions, even controlling for GDP per capita, the wealth factor. And uh, certainly since we're in Canada, China falls way behind Canada as a middle power in its contribution to various areas of global governance. So I, I would say China is, is under participating. Mm -hmm. yeah. now China has had a seat at the United Nations now for a very long time, mm -hmm. once it finally wrested it away from Taiwan. Okay. So it's, it's been a key player in at least one uh, pivotal global governance organ. It wasn't a member of the G7 or G8, but now the G20 is taking on more and more of the functions that the G7 and G8 used to take, and China is a member of the G20. So how much of this is the f simply a function of the fact that China is relatively late in the game getting into at least some of the relevant groups that do take responsibility for leading global governance? Yeah, well, I think that's certainly a factor. If you want to explain why China seems to be underplaying its role, uh, the, the short history, relatively speaking, short history of China's involvement uh, is a factor. But if you ask uh, diplomats, I'm sure you interact with them all the time, uh, the level of sophistication on the part of China's diplomats, for example, statesmen, uh, is actually quite high. So if you're thinking, oh, maybe this is a new country not experienced enough, not knowing the rules, I don't.